All right, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, hey, everyone. I know some of you already, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brian Hughes. I'm a front-end engineer at Patreon. Uh, I've been doing a bunch of stuff in the past. I've also done a fair amount of node work. Uh, as part of my career, I've actually been a part of three successful, really complicated rewrites at companies. This is, of course, an open source conference, so I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff, really. Instead, we're going to talk about robots, specifically open source JavaScript robots. So really long time ago now, back in 2014, I created an open source project called Raspberry IO. And this project is a plugin to provide Raspberry Pi support to a much larger project called Johnny5. Uh, and Johnny5 is, or I guess was, it's not really used anymore, this project that enabled us to access hardware from uh, on like Arduinos, or Raspberry Pis, things like that, using Node.js and JavaScript. It was actually pretty closely inspired by jQuery. So really popular project, brought a lot of folks in. Of course, these days we have different ideas on how we want to access hardware from JavaScript. You know, the world has evolved quite a bit, but it's been a pretty successful project. Now, when I created this plugin, uh, I created it basically over a weekend. It was like kind of one of those hacks where I was like, I just kind of want this to happen. And then release out to the world, you know, kind of became uh, popular. In fact, uh, this plugin became the most popular platform for Johnny Five for a period of time, in fact. But as happens, whenever we write these things quickly over a weekend, it wasn't the best written thing ever. So in December of that year, I started decomposing this project into separate uh, packages on NPM. There's, I think, about 10 or so of them total. And a plugin like this really makes sense for decomposition because there's you know, GPIO support that sort of sits in one corner of the code base, then there would be you know, serial ports in another, and like all these different pieces of hardware that just aren't really related to each other. Now, whenever this kind of decomposition happens, my project follow basically what all projects do that go down this path. You know, we break off a piece, we clean it up, it's in really good shape, kind of sitting over here. We break off another piece, sitting over here. Uh, and there ends up being this like one little ball of yarn in the middle. It's like that last bit of code you never really touched. And it kind of keeps going, it keeps aging, keeps getting a little more brittle, harder to maintain. And yeah, I got to the point where I was kind of afraid to touch it, because every time I did, I felt like I broke it. So this is kind of a problem. I was like, all right, it's time to rewrite this last piece. I've rewritten the rest of it. I converted you know, ES5, which was the newest thing at the time. I converted all to ES6 and newer, converted to TypeScript, except for this one module. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do this, and in February of 2019, like a whole five years later, so not that long ago, I finally rewrote this core module. And once I had done it, the entire code base had been rewritten at some point in time or another. Now, the thing about this last rewrite, though, I kind of mentioned this one specifically, is because before I successfully rewrote it, I actually failed at it four times. Like, I mean, you know, I created the branch, I start writing code, run into some kind of dead and regressions, just utterly failed, had to throw the entire thing in the trash. Like, I failed four times to rewrite this thing before I finally succeeded. And it wasn't because I got to be a better programmer, better coder, better at hardware or anything. You know, I was already a pretty skilled coder whenever I started this project. The thing that caused me to succeed was actually about planning. And this was like the big lesson, is that a successful rewrite, it's not about your technical skills or your coding skills, really. It's really about how you plan the project. So for this talk, we're, I'm mostly going to talk about the planning process, how we think about this, how we approach it, and break down these problems, because these are often like pretty large problems. But before we go into the planning, first, I kind of want to talk about a taxonomy of rewrites. So you know, I have this whole uh, talk title, you know, to rewrite or not rewrite, that is the question. You know, Hamlet is my favorite Shakespeare in playing, and I just couldn't resist to create this title. But it's a bit of a red herring, actually, and a bit of an intentional one. Because when we talk about rewrites, you know, both in this talk, but just generally we talk about rewrites, we think of it as this binary thing. It's either we're going to do it or we're not going to do it. But that's not really reality. Whenever we do a rewrite, it can mean a whole bunch of different things. So I kind of want to walk through that first before we start talking about how to actually do this stuff. And so I kind of came up with this myself, but based on terms that, you know, I, myself and a bunch of others have used before. Uh, and basically, these go from like least amount of effort and scope to most. There's what I call a full rewrite, a partial rewrite, a heavy refactor, and a light refactor uh, with you know, different effort and scope as we kind of go up to this upper left quadrant. Now, the taxonomy actually implies two other types. I'm not going to talk about this talk, so they're not on this page. But the other option is we're just going to abandon the old project and create something brand new. 
or maybe just let it go do whatever it's going to do. You know, I kind of think of like, you know, when, say, Mateo um, created Fastify, right? Express already existed for Node. Good project, but Mateo's like, I could do something totally different. So instead of working with Express, he created his own framework, right? I think it was a good move, but that's not a rewrite, right? So we're not going to talk about that here. The other option not listed here is to do absolutely nothing, to just leave it as is and live with it, right? It doesn't really fit in this taxonomy, like on this chart, but we are going to talk about that a little bit here in a bit. But for mostly, when I'm talking about rewrites, I'm going to be talking about these four variations, especially partial rewrites and heavy refactors, because I think that's what we mostly do. But what do I mean by this? So first, let's talk about a full rewrite. A full rewrite happens whenever our new project, like once we're done rewriting, is not based at all on the old, old code. Like there's no code shared between them. This is we take the old code, we throw it in the trash, and we start from a blank canvas. Now these are pretty rare. Typically, I only see these happens whenever we are completely changing languages. Let's say we're migrating something from Java to Node.js, or if we're in the tooling world, you know, what a lot of we're doing these days is migrating from Node.js to Rust. Right? In that case, we can't share code because you know, the language is different, the libraries, everything is completely different. There's no way to share code. Um, unless you do, say, FFI or something, which I know a few of you work on here, but we're just going to ignore that. Uh, but sometimes, though, we don't have a new language. We might be going from JavaScript to JavaScript, but it still does a big enough change because, say, we're changing out a base framework. You know, we have this library. Maybe it works with a framework or an application built on a framework. And we're going to shift that out, you know, the core foundation of what we build on. So, uh, for example, when I did work at a company, okay, I lied, I'm going to mention one company refactor I did. We had a backbone uh, base, you know, if you remember backbone, the UI framework back in the day. We had that, we migrated to React. And the mental models are so radically different between them that we couldn't share any code. It's just incompatible, conceptually speaking. And whenever we do these rewrites, usually a full rewrite, this almost happens in a, usually happens in a new repo entirely. You know, we leave the old one where it is and we create something brand new because there's just nothing to share. And not always, it's possible to do it in the same repo, but this is usually what we see. Stepping down the list a bit, then we have a partial rewrite. And so in a partial rewrite, you know, it's less than a full write. In this case, it is based on old code. You know, we're not throwing everything away. We are reusing some bits of code. This is always the same language by definition. And it's usually the same base framework, because we are changing those, changing those concepts, but not always. This one may or may not be in a new repository. And this just kind of depends on personal preference. But when we're doing a partial rewrite, it's like while we are reusing co uh, code from the previous system, usually we're ripping out the foundation. We're kind of ripping out you know, the, the bones of the old project and replacing it with something brand new. You know, this isn't just touching bits and pieces. This could be something like uh, in the node world if we have some like networking middleware uh, or something that's built on top of that, a server especially, and it's based on Express and we want to replace it with Fastify, back to that example. That's kind of ripping out the guts of this. You know, even if we are reusing code, the core nature of how this thing works is changing. But going down the list, uh, then we have a heavy refactor, which again is based on the old code. It's the same language and is always the same base framework but a lot of code is affected. This is one where the foundations aren't really changing, but the amount of code that is affected in a heavy refactor is usually on par with the amount of code affected by a partial rewrite. But this, the difference is that skeleton is staying the same. So the way I like to think of this is say we have an open source JavaScript framework that does a lot of asynchronous work. You know, we could have this thing that's written all using callbacks. You know, I'm sure there's a few of those that still exist out there. And we decide, all right, this isn't how JavaScript developers want to code. So we're going to convert this in you know, a new major version to be promise-based so we can use async await. Right? In this case, you know, the basic foundation is the same, but that, as we can imagine, is going to have ramifications for the entire code base. You know, we're going to have to end up making changes throughout the whole thing. And then finally, we have a light refactor which again is based on old code, same language, same base fr frameworks, like a heavy refactor. But in this case, not that much code is affected. Oftentimes, light refactors can look like heavy refactors, but just in kind of one little corner of the code base. You know, it's like just over here where we're affecting it. Uh, and the rest of it we're kind of leaving as is. So this is kind of the taxonomy and the way I like to think about rewrites in different scopes uh, and you know, amount of effort and things like that. So, let's start talking about planning. So the first step in any rewrite is to define the problem. 
Uh, this is a really, really crucial step, is we want to talk about what is the problem we're trying to solve by doing this rewrite. You know, it's really important. It's also one we kind of tend to skip a lot of times, I feel like. You know, we really want to say, we want to do this rewrite because X, Y, Z. And when we do that, the most important thing is to be specific. Because if we say, well, I want to rewrite this code because the code sucks, I mean, that can very well may be true, but that's not a reason, right? That's just your, you know, an opinion about a thing, it's expressing dislike. That's not a reason. We want to say, we want to write this because this part of the code base over here is really brittle, and every time we change it, we introduce regressions and get 100 new bug reports. Right? We want to be specific on like, what our problem is that we're trying to solve. And not only that, when we're talking about these problems, it's important for us to think about describing the impact of this problem, not just an opinion or view of the problem. So again, I like, this code sucks and is brittle. That's not about impact. That's, again, that's just an opinion on what we think of the code base. The impact is, well, we keep making mistakes and causing regressions and people keep filing bugs, right? We want to talk about how does this impact the people who use our project especially. It could also be how does it impact maintainers on our project. That's also an important part, especially since, you know, we always hope that, you know, people who use our project will one day become collaborators and maintainers. So if we have a code base where something is a spaghetti ball that's really hard for people to onboard to, and we, thus we aren't getting new collaborators on our project, that could be a, a valid reason too. But again, that impact is we can't get new collaborators on our project, right? Not this is a spaghetti ball and I don't like it, right? So we really want to talk about that impact. And while we're doing this, it's really important for us to write it down. I think this is a, a really crucial step that can be kind of uh, overlooked. Because uh, I know, at least for me, whenever I'm thinking about a problem in, in any kind of code base, I think, well, oh yeah, this thing over here, it's, it's horrible, it's causing all these problems. And I have this idea that feels clear in my head when I think about it. But the minute I go to write it down, I realize, oh, I actually haven't thought this through very much. There's something about the act of writing it down that really forces us to get explicit uh, about these problems that we have. And so like, this is what we really wanted to do to, do to define the problem. And there's another reason we want to do this, not just for the sake of having this, which we'll use later, but also, if you can't define the problem, if you're struggling with these steps, like, you know, it's really hard to articulate impact of this, uh, or it's hard to articulate specifically why something is a problem, this is a sign that probably we shouldn't do a rewrite, right? Because if we can't really define impact and things like that, that means this is more of a, I don't like this, as opposed to this is causing us problems, and that's a sign we should probably just leave it as is, even if it may not necessarily be ideal. Because doing rewrites, they take time and effort, and that prevents us from doing other stuff. All right, so I already answered a part of the title of this talk. So this is what, how we know if we should rewrite or not. It's like, if we can't define the problem, then we shouldn't rewrite. Once we've figured out our problem, we've really articulated this well, the next step is to determine our constraints. And I want to start with a quote by Marissa Mayer. Uh, the company she ran at the time may not have aged well, but I think this quote has aged uh, quite well despite that. And it's that constraints shape and focus problems and provide clear challenges to overcome. Creativity thrives best when constrained. You know, I think we tend to think a lot of like creativity. We think, oh, if we have you know, a blank slate, this wide open field, that allows us to be the most creative. That's not really true, uh, at least certainly not in my experience, uh, both as a coder and as an artist. I'm a photographer, so like, Photo on the first page was the one I took. Uh, and I think it's also true in coding. You know, there are so many ways we can solve any given project. If we don't sort of narrow the field of possible solutions, it can be really hard to know where to start, and especially hard to find what is the best solution uh, we can do, you know, well, given our constraints. Right? That's why we need to define those constraints so we can actually come up with a better solution. And the first one to start with is to list intended breaking changes if you have any. So one of the, uh, the big reasons that folks want to do refactors sometimes is there may be some new functionality we want to add to our project, but something about our architecture or maybe some core dependencies or something like that is actively preventing us from implementing that feature. Uh, and so we want to do breaking changes. Uh, and, and that's actually the motivation for the rewrite. But we want to get explicit about this. We want to really write down what is it we want to change. Because this actually ends up being a constraint. And then this actually helps us with the next step, which is basically the inverse, which is to define our backwards compatibility needs. You know, if we're doing a rewrite, this is some project that exists, where obviously we want at least some backwards compatibility. 
there's no backwards compatibility, we're writing a new project. This isn't a rewrite. But how backwards compatible should we be does kind of depend on the project. If you're doing a smaller project, something that's you know, a little more niche, like Raspberry IO that I wrote, we actually tend to have a little bit more leeway with breaking changes, because we just don't have the sheer volume of people that we're gonna break. This isn't always true, of course, but like, generally that's kind of been my experience. If you're a really large project, you typically have less tolerance for breaking changes. If you're some sort of mission critical project, such as Node or jQuery, something like that, we usually have very, very little tolerance for breaking changes. And the reason for that is we really want people to upgrade. Right? The more breaking changes you have, that's a barrier to entry and the more people you'll have not upgrade. And so especially in the world of uh, Node.js and jQuery, like Robin was talking about earlier, you know, we really need to get people upgraded because they're running on old versions with security vulnerabilities. And like, this is you know, a serious issue on the internet. You know, something like uh, jQuery runs on, see if I remember these stats right, 77% of all websites and was I think about maybe half or so were running version one or older, something like that. Which is a little scary, right? Because there are no security vulnerabilities in that. So whenever we're doing these upgrades, we want to make it as easy as possible for our users to upgrade so we can get as many of them on board. And so we get that bit of a tension between what we want to move forward and how much we're going to prevent others from kind of going with us. And so very closely related to, to this is we also want to determine the consequences from regressions. So this is the big risk with a rewrite. In fact, this is the biggest risk, hands down. Whenever we do a rewrite, we put ourselves at risk of regressions in a way that we just don't have doing normal development on a project. Uh, and the heavier of a rewrite we do, the more regressions we're gonna have. It's just the nature of the beast. We cannot prevent them. But there are things we can do to minimize them, and, you know, depending on how much effort we wanna put into it. So we wanna think, again, if this is something that's really mission critical, stability and lack of regressions is paramount, and so we have to go really slow, really steady, and invest a lot in the rollout process to make sure we break as few people as possible. All right, so now that we've defined our problem, and we have like, determined our constraints, it's time to actually start planning the project out to figure out, all right, how are we actually you know, gonna do this? And like one thing that the previous sections help with, and the reason we go through this exercise is that they kind of paint the way for us. You know, we can think of defining the problem as that is we're in a way defining where we want to be. We're defining our destination. The destination is a world in which we don't have that problem. And then the constraints kind of help us to figure out what is the path to get to that destination. It's like filling out a map almost is the way I think of it. You know, our constraints tell us where we can't go, and that starts to give us a little bit of vision of where we're going. And I found in practice, whenever I go through these exercises, I usually already have at least a rough idea of what the solution should be like, just by writing out those things right there. Because again, constraints breed creativity. And so, you know, we think about this, we start getting ideas in our head. And with this, we can start thinking about how much code is gonna be affected. This is not something that we have to be, you know, really in depth about it. You know, we're certainly not gonna go line by line through everything, file by file. But we can just take sort of an intuitive sense of, we know we want to get to this place. I think it's going to affect a third of the code base, you know, three quarters of the code base, something like that. And so once we have a sense of like roughly how much code we might think would be affected, and again, this is just a thought experiment, doesn't have to be fancy, then we can go back to this taxonomy and we figure out which of these approaches is going to work best. Because all these approaches really just kind of affect how much work we're going to do. And you might notice I actually swapped out the axis labels on this chart compared to the previous one. Instead of talking about effort and time, I'm now talking about risk and time. Because again, the more we go to the upper left of this quadrant towards a full rewrite, the greater the risk we're taking on. So if we're in a project where we have to be really risk averse, we really don't want to get into that upper left. We want to get as far to the bottom right as we can. We really want to do as little as possible. This might sound counterintuitive and like, you know, we want to do a rewrite and we want to do as little as possible. That sounds like it's intention, but that's kind of the world we live in. And it is a tension that we have to balance. But once we have this, you know, we can figure out which of these works, and that starts to paint us like, oh, should I create a new repository for this or do in the existing one? Should we have a long-lived feature branch or not? Uh, and all of those kind of like in the weeds decisions of how we're gonna use you know, GitHub to manage this project, you know, assuming we are using GitHub. And you know, I've seen projects do all of these. In fact, whenever I refactored Raspberry IO, 
I end up using heavy refactor, partial rewrite, and light refactor all at some point in time. They definitely all have their places. Uh, and in fact, so another example I kind of want to talk about is, uh, for those of you who are familiar with CodeMirror, which is an open source uh, code editor used for websites written, of course, in JavaScript. Uh, for the latest version, CodeMirror 6, he did a partial, or I think it might have even been a full rewrite now that I think about it, created a whole new repository uh, because uh, the maintainer Marin wanted to add some new functionality that you couldn't do before. Right, but we want to think about, again, it's like, what is it we're trying to accomplish? We figure out this approach. And then the last thing to consider as we're planning this out is can we do releases incrementally? And we really want to do that if at all possible. You know, because we can think we have all of this work, especially in the you know, heavy refactor or partial rewrite world. We want to do all this code. It's going to affect the majority of the code base. And when we ask, can we split that up into chunks? And this really is ideal. It can be more work to split it up this way. But in the end, it actually kind of helps us out a lot. Because the real problem, if we do, especially you know, a heavy rewrite, we release it all at once. You know, we have the single version where all of a sudden you know, most of the code has changed. Well, think about what's going to happen as soon as we put that out into the world. People are going to find bugs, right? Because there are bugs. So you're going to get this mad rush of bug reports all at once. And, you know, and even for large projects, there's still only so many resources to you know, work with those users, validate the bugs, and things like that. So if we can release incrementally, then we kind of, in a way, lighten our user support load a little bit, you know, because we're spreading that out over time. It can actually even help trace down bugs, too. Because if we're like, oh, it was on this version, but not the next one, where we're halfway through our rewrite, we know it must have been something with that previous release, and we can narrow down what code we think might have uh, introduced that as well. So all right, we've gone through. We've done our planning. We have a, an approach that we have picked out. Now it's time to actually start doing the implementation. And there's a lot of work we can do here to help that rewrite be successful. And I'm not going to go too much in coding, because honestly, the day-to-day -day coding of a rewrite looks like any other kind of coding. There's nothing really special about it, aside from testing. And so the tips for that, the first thing I recommend doing is craft solid types before you even start the rewrite if you don't have them. And I'm not saying you have to rewrite your code base in TypeScript, because that itself is a rewrite. But you know, most open source projects, especially in the JavaScript world, there are types available, even if it's third party through definitely typed. So we, wanna, we can make use of those. But we want to look and say, like, are these high quality solid types? Or are they just kind of so-so? Eh, you know, and I've certainly seen both out there in the wild. And the reason that this is really useful is if we can get solid types where you know, we're accurately defining all of our API services, we've accurately marked what's optional, what's not, that can serve as a template as we go through our rewriting, and we kind of check our new implementation against what it's supposed to do. You know, there's always that classic case of, oh, there's some property in an object that's optional, and we forgot to check if it's undefined. You know, simple stuff like that. You know, this is where TypeScript can help us find that, but only if we have the right types to begin with. You know, we can do the before after comparison. Very similarly, we should also implement comprehensive tests before we start the rewrite. You know, whether it's unit tests or integration tests, for the exact same reason. It's like, as we're going through and we're running this, we can compare the old code to the new code to make sure that they actually behave the same. And this is something we want to do all throughout. And you're probably thinking to yourself, isn't that just test-driven development? And yes, it is. So test-driven development is something that I actually don't particularly use day to day. Uh, I think it has its place. Some people think it's a universal thing. What I will say is I think in rewrites, this is where test-driven development's value really comes out. Like This is the sweet spot for TDD. Because in this case, we are comparing two separate implementations. We want to make sure they behave the same. And we can use common tests as you know, the way for checking that contract. And we go through. And if we have this in place, the rewrite always comes a bit paint-by-numbers-ish. It becomes surprisingly boring. And boring is good. In fact, whenever I rewrote Raspberry when I finally succeeded, this was the thing that enabled me to succeed. Those first four times I failed, I didn't have, or I think I had very rough types for that package, but I didn't have anything in depth. And I actually had no unit tests at all for this project. This is not great. Hardware is a little different. It can be hard to unit test hardware because that's not software. You, you can't exactly mock a motor, you know. But uh, I figured out a way to do it. And I spent a lot of time writing tests before I even started changing the code in that module. And this is what enabled me to succeed. And whenever I did finally release it, I think I only had about three regressions. Uh, well, at least I had anyone discovered. You know, I had a couple of bug reports in, but it was surprisingly few. 
And it was this test-driven development method that really enabled this to succeed. Now, of course, this is specifically if you are doing a coding rewrite. There are other kinds of refactors out there, such as, say, swapping out a CI-CD system. So that looks a little different you know, in the details. But at a high level, we can think of it as the same. You know, in, say, an infrastructure change, we can look at like, what are the artifacts before and after. We can start diffing you know, files that are the output of our CI CD and be like, did this change or not? Because they should, again, be the same. All right, so we spent a lot of time. We've written this code. We're actually ready to get it out into the wild. Now we're ready to do our release. But this is also where we need to be kind of careful, slow, and thoughtful about how we're doing our release. And some of this is probably pretty obvious advice, but you know, most importantly, we really want to do alpha, beta, and release candidates. Uh, we want to get this out there. We want to get people testing it to surface bugs early. And when we mark these things as this is an alpha release or a beta release, we're giving an indication of quality, and we're asking for feedback. Because the thing about a rewrite that's a little different than writing new code is we have no idea where the bugs can pop up. Statistically, they're, they're not cor really correlated with anything because we changed everything. So you know, if we had a new feature, of course we're looking, does someone have a bug with this feature? But especially if this is a large project and like, you don't know where the bugs are coming from, you need a really lengthy testing process to try to surface that, because you just need more testing. And so alpha, beta release candidates, they really help a lot with that. You know, don't be afraid to use these and go through a lot of them. You know, with Code Mirror, for, you know, going back to that example again, which was a full rewrite, I think it was in a beta in the release candidate for two years, maybe? I don't remember exactly the dates, but it was measured in the order of years. But again, it was a successful one. I think it's a great project, by the way. Something else to remember is that Simver is more than just API signatures, right? We really want to make sure we get Simver right, especially when we're doing a rewrite because of some of these extra unknowns and the surface area that we're talking about with a rewrite. And when we think of Simver, I think a lot of folks, we just tend to think, did we change API signatures? Right? This is really important, of course. You know, we definitely want to pay very close attention to how we're changing APIs. Uh, but this is just the start. And I think it's the, a lot of folks focus on this because it's kind of the easiest one. It's really easy to say, did we rename a function or a property? Right? That's a very binary and obvious decision. But there's other things, too. Did we change our system requirements, for example? Say we drop support for older versions of Node.js right? because we want to use newer ECMAScript features. That needs to be a breaking change, right? And in general, anytime we do a major version release, we do that because there's a chance we will have broken someone's code in known ways, right? Regressions don't count, right? Regressions, you know, there's always a chance for regressions that can happen on a patch release. But if we know there is even a chance that someone will break, we have to do a major version release. But even beyond system requirements, because even these are still somewhat obvious to reason about, the next one is behavior changes. And these are the ones that can be the most difficult, I think, to identify, but this is really critical. And as an example, this is where I think React did a really good job recently. Uh, so they re released React 18, uh, I forget how long ago, six months, a year, something like that. And this was a major change, one of the biggest changes they have actually made to that project since it was created. You know, they did a lot of like fundamental changes to how the core rendering engine works. Uh, as well as, you know, and so they were thinking like, how do we do this? How do you do this upgrade? So they actually released an intermediate release, React 17. React 17 was kind of a, a no new features release, and that was on purpose. But it's still a major version upgrade, and that's because there was no changes to the API at all. They didn't even add anything, I don't think. Uh, so the API was exactly the same. I don't think they changed any of the system requirements, if I remember right. What they did change, though, was behavior. And it was a very subtle one, but an important one. Uh, so in React, this is, again, web uh, technology. So uh, excuse me if you all aren't web folks. This might be a bit lost. But in React, uh, there's event handlers that it adds basically to the root of you know, its own space to fire off various events because we're bubbling up and down the DOM. And so in React 16 and before, those event handlers were actually attached to the body element, so kind of the, the root of the DOM that the browser actually creates for us. In React 17, they changed it so it's instead attached to the div, the root div that it's rendering inside of. Sounds really simple. It's exactly the same events. They happen in the exact same order. They have the same data. But just that little change of putting where they're located actually raised the possibility that they could break folks. And in fact, at Patreon, when we went to, through our upgrade to React 17, we did have a few uh, breakages because of this. Uh, 
but we need to look for them. Because again, they were really good about saying, hey, this is a break and change, be on the lookout. So we went and looked for it. We found, I think, three or four places. We fixed them in about a day, and we were good to go. It was a really painless process. But that's because you know, React put in this effort to identify what the breaking changes are beyond just API signatures. So really related to that, it's also really critical that we write good change logs and upgrade guides. Uh, this one may seem obvious, but I've encountered uh, kind of a scary number of open source projects that have no change log whatsoever. I'll say, oh, there's some major version upgrade, what broke? And I look, I have no idea what changed. I have to go look through commits. Most people aren't gonna do this. And even people who do go through look commits, like I sometimes do, I usually skip it, but when I do, even then it's really easy to miss stuff because I don't know the projects, you know, I don't really know the impact of a code change or anything like that. So it's really, really critical that we write out a change log saying here's what we changed, here's what we broke and how, especially for this behavioral stuff. And when we're doing a rewrite, it's also really important, I mean this may sound like a, why would we bother? This seems a little silly, but we really should talk about here's the code we changed, even if it's only at a high level. We can say we rewrote this, you know, all the code behind this function here. And the reason we want to do that, especially if we're doing an incremental release, is that we're pointing our users to an area so that they can be aware of a change. You know, because we wrote this, there could be regressions that we don't know about. And if we say, hey, we rewrote this part of the code for users who are using you know, that specific function then they can look and say like, hey, did this thing change? They'll know to test that a little more. Or, more, or also, if they're like, oh, well, we don't use that function, then they can skip that testing and they can just kind of go about the day and they can save a little bit of time. And they'll be more likely to get that next upgrade whenever they do know they need to put in time. But also, it's more than just change logs. It's also upgrade guides. You know, change logs are, I kind of think of them as like an API reference. You know, they're very specific, they're very technical, they're kind of in the weeds. You know, they list out all these details. It can be hard to get the big picture. And so an upgrade guide is also really important. And this is where we talk about, you know, here's why we did these upgrades. We can give context. And since you know, we went through that whole exercise at the beginning to really define the problem, we can just link straight to that. You know, we wrote it down, you know, presumably in, say, an issue or markdown file somewhere, so we can just link to that. Uh, and this gives people even more context of here's why we made this change. And hopefully that can help pe people get a little excited, especially if you can give a glimpse of like, we made this change because we've got this really cool thing coming in the future, like you're gonna love it when it comes out. And we can kind of whet that appetite a bit in an upgrade guide. It's kind of a fun thing to do. And also this just kind of helps guide people along. Because again, whenever we do these rewrites, we're doing them so that people will adopt it, right? And if it's hard to do, people aren't gonna do it. Uh, and so something I like to say about documentation is you know, we can write the best code in the world, we can have the greatest API, but if it's not documented, it doesn't exist. So di like documentation is, I think in some ways, the most critical part of open source, but also oftentimes the most underfunded and kind of underappreciated, which is unfortunate. But all right, so we've gone through this, we've written our code, we've released it to the world, people are using it. So I wanna kinda like zoom out a little bit because I'm at least hoping that the things I've talked about here aren't all that novel or new. I hope this is at least somewhat obvious things that y'all have seen before. And yet, still, I've seen a lot of rewrites fail. You know, I failed myself a couple of times. Uh, and interestingly, at two of the three companies where we did a rewrite, I happened to join just a couple months after they had previously tried to rewrite and failed. And so then I came in, and in the second attempt is when we made it successful. And I've realized that success in a rewrite, it's not just about writing good code. It's not just even just about following these steps. It all comes back to why are we doing this? How are we thinking about it? And what is our mindset? And so the first tip around mindset I want to give, also classic saying, it's cliche at this point, but it's so true. And that's don't let perfect be the enemy of good. You know, when we go in it and we do a rewrite, we have this sort of instinct and desire to make it perfect. You know, it's like, this is the chance to do a clean slate. We're gonna fix all the things we hate about our old code. It's gonna be amazing, it's gonna be perfect, it's gonna be performant, there'll be no bugs, everyone can write it, it'll probably cure cancer while we're at it, the way people talk about this stuff. But that's not how it works in practice. Every rewrite will always be imperfect. It will always have issues and flaws, and we just need to be okay with that. We need to accept and embrace that that's part of the process. Because if we don't, that's how we end up spinning our wheels. We spin forever on this, this thing never actually gets released, or if it does, by the time it's released, the whole project is you know, obsolete, or things like that. 
And then the next question again is, do you even need to rewrite a refactor? And I talked earlier about how we can kind of think about what will tell us do we need to do this or not, right? Again, it's like, what are our reasons? What's the impact? We need to be really, really critical about this because like as engineers, I think we're just kind of predisposed to want to rewrite. You know, I know I certainly am. You know, I've been in code bases where I've been like, oh, this is awful, we should spend time rewriting. But then we usually, with the help of good managers, uh, at least in the past, before I started thinking this way, they'll say like, oh, let's step back. Let's think, all right, what is the impact? Why, do we, why should we actually do this? And so we need to be really critical of these kind of like, you know, motivations and desires that we have around instincts and ask, do we really even need to do this? And actually step back even a bit further and ask is like, why do we rewrite? And I mean this like at an existential level, why do we as engineers want to do rewrites all the time? It seems like we're always talking about rewriting. Like, where does that come from? Like, what is that desire? What pushes us to do that? And I think there could be a lot of reasons to do it, right? It does depend. But I think one of them is it's this kind of emotional response. It's, I hate this code, especially if someone else wrote it. You know, not us, but if someone else wrote it. Well, sometimes us, too. I've looked at my old code, and I hate that. But, you know, we look at that like, oh, this is so awful. I could do such a better job. You know, I can get this out there. It's going to be amazing. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to be amazing. And you notice I'm using a lot of I statements. Right? When we get this desire, a lot of times it ends up because, kind of because of ego, in a way. You know, this is something that we want to do better. At. You know, uh, and it's not necessarily we want to show off what we can do, but it can also be because we're unhappy with what we're doing. But it's all about this kind of thing. It's like we just want to come out and do it. We don't really think about, well, what's the actual benefit here? You know, we don't think about others, right? It's I statements. And so really, what I think when it comes to rewriting, like the most important thing with mindset is that we should rewrite to serve others. We're doing this rewrite to help. Right? We want to do this to make it easier for people to use our project, or easier for people to come on board and become collaborators on our project. Or we want to do this to give new power to the users of our project, to create amazing new things they couldn't do before. It's ultimately about enabling and empowering other people. If we really keep that at the core, whenever we're thinking about rewriting, we're thinking about how we do it, how we go through it, I think that's the real way to success there, is to think, how can we make other people's lives better, not just ours? With that, I want to thank you for listening. All right, looks like we have a few minutes, uh, if anyone has any questions. Uh, I think you might have been first, but yeah, we'll go with you next. I have a question. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. But at the same time, I think another really good reason that crops up is that we work in technology, which changes every day. And so mm -hmm. as we are learning, right at the end of writing something, you might have a better way to write it already. So mm -hmm. going back to something that's old that's yours or somebody else's, I think it's just a, hey, I've got more experience now. I could make this better. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that comes up for us a lot. But to your point of the value you need to have the value there because maybe it is just a refactor of one section that could have a lot of value versus the mm -hmm. whole thing, which is probably not worth it. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I think you nailed it. Uh, and, and I would even take it a step further. Is like if we're doing a rewrite without changes to it to enable something else, at least immediately, like if we're successful, no one will know we've done anything at all, right? And so that kind of gets us to this question of like, well, what does this actually get us if no one even noticed, right? We hope it's because we now get to go do something else really cool, right? It's we're enabling something else. Um, first, thank you for the presentation. And uh, I would say you took the main point. And as a remark, I would insist on what you said, like the testing part, when you are mm -hmm. implementation. I, I did full reward for my company. Mm -hmm. And we were lucky in that case, the project was not well, we had a lot of integration testing, unit testing, shadow traffic of the client and everything. Mm -hmm. And I can say to you, it's really a game changer. If you have no test, and you, I think you saw with your experience, first three times, no test, or not enough. For all the guys there, really, be sure that you have one, one or another that say red or green. If you don't have that, it's a failure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, especially in this case, because like, again, this is either the test passes or it doesn't. Like, this gives us a very clear indication of 
did we port this right? And so yeah, we need to surface that. This is, you know, we need good CI CD integration uh, you know, in our source control to tell us that, to give us that pass fail, definitely. And I would say sometimes you can just maybe not need to write the test. Often you can just get it from existing usage if you can. Like if somebody mm -hmm. uses your application or your API or whatever, think of way to capture what they do and more or less you don't even need to know if it's even a bug because maybe you want to reproduce that bug in a sense because it's still a feature change if you don't have mm -hmm. a bug anymore. So you want to capture that and it's a great tool to, to perform a migration. Uh, yeah, so if, if I'm following you correctly, you're saying like this is also really basically observability is what we're talking about at this point. Like we have really good observability. So this gets more into the product realm. It's kind of why I didn't go into it for the open source world. Uh, but depending on telemetry, you might be able to do this here. But like certainly in the sort of like company, we've got a product for end users world. Observability is really critical too. Is we want to have like lots of instrumentation of how people are using our apps, so we can look at that. You know, especially if we're doing. Uh, like an A-B test or something like that between these two, then we can look and say, like, are our analytics looking the same between the two? And if not, that can be a problem, too. I, mean, I don't think we see that as much in open source. Uh, again, it depends on the project. You know, you might be able to get that instrumentation. You know, VS Code has it, for example. Um, but yeah, it, it's very powerful, especially uh, at companies. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned that um, for package authors, um, providing a way to upgrade from one version to another when you rewrite APIs and things. Um, uh, one suggestion I would also make is like provide code mods. Uh, they have been mm -hmm. proven to be very useful. Um, and once you get a hang of build, like writing AST modification, like it takes a little bit like learning curve. Uh, but if if you have a tool that you know you can just run and it updates interfaces. Uh, of all files, um, that has been proven to be very powerful. Uh, yeah, definitely. Code mods are also great. Uh, and in fact, if it's something we think that might, a code mod would be useful down the road, we can even think about that early on with our breaking changes to make sure that we change the API in such a way that a code mod would be able to detect it. Right? Yeah, so that's J not ambiguous. JS Code Shift had, I've been using JS Code Shift for most yeah. of the time. We use it at Patreon as well, along with TS Morph. They're great tools. All right, and I think we are about at time. Again, thank you everyone for coming.